Our next presenter is Alan Foster. Uh, before we bring him out, I want to ask you to just think a minute about crop circles. Uh, perhaps the first thing that might pop into your mind would be, oh, how many are real? How many are fake? Well, look, that, that's not a really important question, okay? We know that lots and lots and lots of them are real. Here's the big question that I'm interested in finding out. Why do we have crop circles? Huh? I think that's a, a question that is really worth answering. Alan Foster has traveled to be with us this week from England. And uh, folks, he has some really, really, really interesting answers to that big question. And after his presentation, I think your next big question is going to be, what if he's right? Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Foster. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Good, thanks. Um, just like to thank Bob and all the organizers for inviting me. Thank you very much. Um, just before I start, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Alan Foster. I'm a writer, researcher, and lecturer on UFOs, crop formations, environmental and spiritual issues. I've been studying this subject for over 35 years, certainly ufology, since I had a UFO encounter in April 1973. Strangely enough, as I was returning from my confirmation into the church, um, I've worked in various industries, including 15 years in the airline industry, some of that working as a manager of an airline operation that provided the commercial transport for the US military. I was the UK manager and then the Mediterranean manager of the commercial airline travel operation working with the US military and the US naval fleet. Uh, and I currently work in aircraft operations at an international airport. Okay, um, now the title of this talk today is Contact, Awakening and Preparation. Um, which in a way is a reverse of how things actually should be. Um, but we've already had the contact. Um, and certainly the more you look into this subject, it seems as though this has happened throughout the whole of human history. Um, but certainly since in the modern era, since uh, 1947 with the crash at Roswell, uh, it became very clear that UFOs and ETs exist. Now the awakening process probably began in the 60s, but certainly in the uh, late 80s. Uh, with the beginnings of the crop formations, the harmonic convergence, 1987, and, um, and then of course spiritual awakening, cosmic spiritual awakening happening uh, you know, uh, from that time. And I truly now believe we are in that time of preparation uh, where we have, for those who, who have the eyes to see, we have a foundation of these various things that are going on, crop formations, ufology, sort of spiritual awakening. And um, we can use those as a foundation for the things that are coming up, this incredible change that's about to happen. So that basically is the crux of what I want to talk about today, using the crop formations um, interlinked with UFO interactions and other phenomena to show, or they are certainly showing, that something massive is going on here and we're about to go through this incredible change. Now, most of you, of course, are familiar with the crop formations. Um, and um, certainly this week there's been several references to it and, and movies on it as well. But for those of you that are not that familiar, I'd just like to do a brief introduction and um, uh, show that the, the crop formations themselves basically started in the late 80s um, in the UK. Um, up to this date now they've been appearing in over 42 different countries around the world, so it's not just the UK. But in this presentation, um, the, sh the Formations that I show you come from an area in southern England in a couple of counties of Wiltshire and Hampshire. But you'll see the geometry and the mathematics of them are so sublime, it's, in, it's amazing. But um, it wasn't until they, they initially started as simple circles and circles with rings and things like that. But it wasn't until this formation um, appeared in 1990 um, that people around the world started to take a great interest in this. Um, and then also you had then the debunking that came out, that this was just created by um, guys with ropes and planks of wood and things like that. As I say, you'll see some that you'll just know when you look at them. You couldn't do it with ropes and planks of wood. Uh, but this is when the interest began as people started to look into this. 
Um, it's also when um, scientific research began as well in 1990, um, and I'm sure you're familiar with the BLT group, the, um, standing for um, John Burke, the biophysicist Dr. William Levingood, and Nancy Talbert. Um, they, in the States, were receiving um, samples from the within the crop and control samples outside it. And using various professional scientific consultants like biophysicists, analytical chemists, geologists, geochemists, and mineralogists, the conclusion is that the, um, the crop actually goes through a change in its cellular structure. This is in the genuine formations. Um, it's as though there is a superheating of the crop um, probably up to about 800 degrees centigrade in a nanosecond, which turns any moisture within the crop into steam, and then the crop becomes malleable and can in effect be downloaded into whatever image, probably in a matter of seconds. Um, you've also got, as with this image here, um, the crop is often bent at a 90 degree angle at the node or the knuckle of the stem of the crop. Um, and, and this can be sometimes up to a foot off the ground. Um, you also have an elongation of that, uh, that node or even expulsion cavities where the sort of steam blows out of the node, which is, is acknowledging this superheating process. Um, and you also have magnetic anomalies as well in the genuine formations. Uh, sometimes compasses will spin wildly within them um, or um, batteries will fail as well within cameras inside the formation but work outside, you know, okay when you get outside the formation. So again, just briefly touching on that, a huge amount of scientific research showing that some of these formations are, uh, are not made by human means, just by you know, being crushed. There's something going on here. <coughs> now, this formation appeared in 1991 at a place called Barbary Castle, um, which is near um, Swindon in Wiltshire. Uh, at the top, you've got the fort there. Now, the night before this appeared, there were several people doing a night watch um, up on the, uh, the fort. And they said during the night they saw this large triangular UFO hovering above the field and a beam of light that shone down. The following day when they went back to have a look at that particular location, um, there was this formation there. Um, the lines that you see running across are the tram lines where the tractors spray the crops um, as they go up and down. Now, they felt that that formation uh, represented uh, the fact that there should be a balance between mind, body and spirit, which indeed there should. Um, but that, that we are sort of out of balance on this world. Now, what is amazing is there's a connection with that, with, um, actually with Carlos Diaz. And um, you're all familiar with the incredibly beautiful plasma craft. Um, that's the picture taken in 1981 by Carlos. Um, but on the 11th of January, 1998, uh, he was actually filming one of these craft. Um, you've seen the footage, I'm sure. And he went inside the craft and was taken into a large cavern system now, he was at the top of a cavern system looking down, and below him, uh, one of these plasma craft was sort of hovering. And just below, there was a, um, a smooth dome of rock on which was an image that was either carved um, or it was beamed down onto it uh, that looked exactly the same as that crop formation I just showed you. He also was told that that actually represents the fact that we should be balanced between our mind and, and our body and our spirit and that all things are connected um, for, from something as simple as a blade of grass to the oceans with the whales and dolphins to solar systems to galaxies, the universe and other dimensional realities as well are all interconnected and uh, we, we need to understand um, you know, the, the cause and effect from, the, from our actions. Um, so it's a really profound message but again linking crop formations to this sort of ufology that's going on. Now, this is a beautiful formation that appeared in um, June of 1996 at a place called East Field in Alton Barnes in Wiltshire. This is a real mecca area where sort of 80% of the formations appear in the world, uh, but also some of the most complex ones as well. Um, this, is, of course, is known as the uh, double helix of DNA. Now, before we went into that, we were up on a hill which is just near there. Um, on top of the hill is a place called Adam's Grave. We were looking down at the formation. That's where the road runs up, up the hill. So we then walked down into the formation. And while we are in there, sort of feeling the energy, looking at the formation, the flow of the crop, um, suddenly the, uh, the media turned up um, <coughs> from uh, one of the national papers in the UK. 
And they were asking us, you know, what we felt was going on here, what were the crop formations about, which we said, you know, we felt that it was a message, it was a, a really important message for the human race to realise that, that something's happening and we need to wake up to this massive change that's coming. Um, and this, this uh, on the, uh, June the 29th, the Saturday of 1996, this newspaper came out, um, you know, referring to some of the things that we'd said. A little bit of scepticism, as you always get with this subject, but at that time it wasn't too bad. Um, but again, you know, they were, they were at least acknowledging that some of these crop formations were appearing. Now, after the, uh, the media people had left, we stayed in the formation looking around. And while we were there, one of these military helicopters turned up. Um, this is uh, a Westland Gazelle, same as that, it's not that actual craft, but just to give you an idea. Um, and I think you've seen this as well. Um, it's important that people realise that the military are keeping a, a very strong eye on what's going on with the formations. Um, this came in, this craft came in so close that we were actually quite afraid. It was very intimidating and it was harassing the people that were in the formation. It was so close that we could actually see the, the faces of the pilots in the, in the window and they were looking really sort of cold as they stared down at us. Um, and I know of several other researchers that this has happened to as well. And this has been going on, this was 96 and it's been going on up to last year and the year before, 2007, 2008 season. It's a regular occurrence. In fact, one of the researchers, um, she was a lady who um, was um, one of the sort of main figures for setting up conferences in the early to mid-90s, brought a lot of the big speakers to the UK. And she'd been in that very formation that I just showed you. And um, she had just left. She was actually gone back to her car on that hill that I mentioned. And she was filming the formation from above when suddenly she heard this thunderous roar, which sounded basically like a train approaching, but there are no trains around there. When suddenly one of these gazelle helicopters literally came up from below the hill below her, um, right in front of her, and then moved towards her. And um, it was so close that the blades were spinning around. She thought she was actually going to be hit by the blades. And it was, it was knocking up loads of detritus and um, twigs and leaves and things like that. Um, this is, we've seen this on film. Uh, once again, you can see the pilots are just looking. They know what they're doing. So she screamed. She threw the uh, camera on the passenger seat of the car, um, started the car up, drove across the road. Could have had an accident. She didn't look. And as she drove down the hill, she was chased by the helicopter, which uh, buzzed the car back and forward as she drove down this hill. Um, now, eventually, then the helicopter peeled away and she drove on. Now this affected her so much um, that she, to this day she's actually afraid of dragonflies, you know, the ones that sort of fly with that erratic motion um, because of the effect that it had on her. But I just, I just highlight this so you're aware that there's, there's a lot going on here. Crop formations are an amazing thing, but there's also this other side where clearly the military know that something's unusual. There's often been um, film footage of, of helicopters chasing balls of light, uh, which are, are quite a common feature with crop formations as well. So, you know, they know that, that this is not necessarily um, just hoaxing as we would be led to believe. Now this is a beautiful formation that appeared um, on the 7th of July 1996, um, just below Stonehenge. You can see up at the top there, um, you've got the, the circle of Stonehenge. Um, below that is the busy A303 road. So you can see the, the size of the vehicles. On the right hand side you've got uh, a truck. And then this formation here, um, which is about 900 feet in length with 193 circles. Now what is interesting about this, not only was it a beautiful um, geometry, it was a, it's based on a fractal or the golden mean, you see it within nature, this sort of image, um, but there are several witnesses that acknowledge that that formation appeared within um, certainly a 20 or 30 minute time frame. There were some security guards that were doing their rounds at Stonehenge um, and you can sort of look from there down to that field below. And um, they said that um, the, um, there was nothing there when they went round initially. When they came back about 30 minutes later and they looked down, they could see this huge formation and yet they hadn't seen anything happen. There was also the pilot of a light aircraft that was flying people around the, um, the stones. Um, he was showing people that Stonehenge and just up the road is Avebury Stone Circle. And um, he, he flew them around, went back at a local airfield, refueled and came back with some more people to show them the stones about 20 minutes later. And um, when he got there, this huge formation was there. Now he said he knows full well that wasn't there you know, 20, 20 minutes before. 
So once again, this acknowledges the fact that the formations are appearing really quickly, probably in a matter of seconds. And in fact, the people that surveyed that formation, um, it took them at least four hours just to you know, see how the crop was flowing and things like that. So again, it acknowledges they, they appear really quickly. Now, um, many of the formations, particularly genuine formations, of course, have very powerful energies associated with them. Um, and um, in fact, over the years, that one, it's, it's known as the Julia set, um, probably had one of the most powerful uh, of all. Um, this is a painting that my wife did, actually, from the things that she was seeing in that formation, these sort of vortexes or plumes of energy with these spinning balls of light within it. Um, now, it's interesting that over the years, as people have seen that particular image, uh, many people have said that, um, yeah, that's exactly what I saw. I saw the same thing as well. So it was an incredibly powerful formation. You can see Stonehenge on the uh, top right there. Um, what is interesting as well is with this one, it was on one of the, 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 the global major ley lines um, that runs through Stonehenge. Um, so there was, a, there was an additional energy, I think, with this. Many of the formations are on ley lines, um, but this one is an incredibly powerful one. Now, this is stepping up. Um, about a week later, in July of 1996, then this formation appeared. Um, it's a huge formation. It's about 1,000 feet across from left to right. And um, it's actually going through two fields, as you can see. It's just down the road from the Avebury Stone Circle um, and um, at a place called Windmill Hill. Now, this was stepping this up from the single spiral. It was now becoming this sort of uh, this, uh, triple spiral here, as it was known. Now, if, if you can see, there are just um, within one of the, um, where is it, in here, somewhere there, there's a couple of people in that, you can see that. So you can see how big these formations are, they're absolutely massive. Um, the, um, if you look at the first three circles around the central circle, you'll, um, from above, it creates a perfect equilateral triangle. And then you look at the next three, and the next three, and so on and so forth, until you get the last three at the, the, the 1,000 feet across. You end up with this spiraling vortex of equilateral triangles getting bigger or smaller, depending on how you look at it. And this is where the formations are starting to have this sort of hidden geometry going beyond just the 2D plane. <coughs> now, this beautiful formation appeared in 1999. And um, I, I, the reason I show this specifically is just because of the complexity of the crop. Um, when you look at this, it's called the basket for obvious reasons, but you see how the crop has actually been woven. And uh, this is what I want to highlight, the fact that you know, when you go into the formations, they're not just a uh, flattened crop. Um, the genuine ones are actually flowing. They're sort of like liquid. As I said earlier, sometimes about a foot off the ground. Um, in, in areas, there'll be areas where two areas come together and it's like water. It sort of splashes across each other and sometimes you'll get um, like a plaiting like the back of the hair. Um, in this case, as you can see, the, the crop is actually a, a woven pattern. And, um, and in, in the large circles as well, it's got that sort of flow too. Now, unfortunately, this is one of the only photographs of this formation because it was um, when the, far the farmer became aware of it, he went specifically in to cut that formation out, which is quite sad. Um, but it is, it is magnificent, that one. Then this formation appeared. Um, this was in 2000 um, at, at a place called Avebury Truslow. Again, about just a few miles outside of the Avebury Stone Circle in Wiltshire. Um, this is known as the magnetic field for obvious reasons. And um, very much uh, like when we were at school, we used to have, you know, have a piece of paper with iron filings on it, and you'd put a magnet underneath, and you'd get the radial lines of the magnetic field showing very much like this. But of course, this is just uh, you know, diamonds and squares of standing crop. Now, what is really interesting, this appeared in um, June of 2000. 2000. Um, following year, in early 2001, the uh, Graham Bertel, who used to be the UK editor of UFO magazine, um, he was contacted by a guy called Graham Innes, who was involved with scientists researching electrogravitics, anti-grav, and advanced propulsion systems. And he was told that scientists at NASA and elsewhere had determined that the Earth's magnetic field was imminently due to flip. And this was based on comparable satellite data from 1980 through to 2000. And as he said, the process of the magnetic field flipping has begun and is irrevocable. 
It's going to happen, and this is concentrating the minds at NASA more than any other project you can name. Its initial effects will manifest extreme changes in the weather with huge global superstorms, and will probably flip by about 2020. This was based on the, on the comparison or, or the, um, the looking at the data that they had. Now he was asked, Graham Burzel was asked, not to release that information until it became more widely known. Um, so he didn't actually release it until September of 2002. But what is amazing is that this formation appeared in 2000 at the same time as they were making their conclusions about the data that they had regarding the diminishing magnetic field. So again, this is sort of highlighting the fact that the, the intelligence behind the genuine formations are trying to give us messages that are going beyond just geometry and mathematics um, so that we are aware of things. In this particular case, of course, saying, look at your magnetic field. Now, I don't know how clear that is. Um, this is a photograph that I actually took in, on the 30th of October 2003 of the Aurora Borealis um, in, the, in my back garden at home in, in Somerset in southwest England. Now it's very rare that we get the aurora down that far, but um, that particular year there were these huge solar flares and coronal mass ejections that hit the earth. Um, and they were knocking out things like satellites and mobile phone networks. You had those, uh, those powerful um, grid failures in places like New York, Detroit, we had them in the UK and in Italy as well. So um, it was a sort of an example of how solar flares can actually knock out electrical systems. And the fact that we now are so reliant on that, you can see we are, um, you know, it's a, it's a major concern to the way we operate. Um, and of course, with a diminishing magnetic field, then we are much more vulnerable to this type of thing. This aurora was so incredible. This is a picture that's taken with the shutter open um, with about five minutes exposure. And we saw the, um, the aurora come in at the north, it went right over our heads and as far south as we could see. In fact, it was so bright, this one, that it was actually seen as far south as Florida. Um, but I, again, it, as you can see, you know, with a diminishing magnetic field, we do have an issue. Now also, talking of which, um, the, um, I know of a couple of people that have actually said that they've seen birds react um, in a strange way around crop formations. Um, one of them was uh, a lady who saw a flock of pigeons approaching a crop formation. They, uh, the flock actually split. Um, as it approached the formation, flew around uh, the formation and then connected again at the other side, rejoined and continued. So this was showing the fact that the formations, the genuine formations, actually have a huge dome of energy around them and I suspect actually going into the earth as well. Um, this of course can be detected by dowsers and people you know, with sensitive um, hands can feel the energies and equipment as I mentioned earlier. Um, and of course, um, doves and pigeons are birds that uh, navigate using the magnetic field. So it's as though they clearly could see that there was something uh, beyond that. <coughs> so much so that actually some helicopters as well have had problems with their instrumentation as they fly directly over a formation when they're taking the aerial photographs. Um, but it's only over the formation where this happens that the instruments sort of go wild as they go over it and then clear up again once they go beyond it, only near the formations. So this shows again that many of these are not being created by blokes with planks of wood and ropes. You know, it is a, is a, there's a huge energy involved here. This is another beautiful formation that appeared in 2000 um, at a place called Woodborough Hill. And um, in fact, if you squint your eyes slightly, you see it actually brings out a more three-dimensional aspect to it, uh, as though it's a ball of wool or um, the head of a sunflower or even an opening lotus flower, which of course is very relevant to spiritual awakening. And then this formation appeared. This is in 2000, June of 2000, known as the silicon chip for obvious reasons. Um, now, this, talking of energies, this had a really negative energy. Um, in fact, there are, I know several people that said they couldn't even go into that formation. As they approached it, um, before they got to the actual um, formation itself, the energy was so sort of negative, they felt nauseous and sick and, and didn't even go into it. Um, but, um, and this highlights the issue that there are several different sort of agencies at work here, I think. Certainly you've got the hoaxing side of it, but I think uh, there is an ET element to this, possibly some, some cases are negative ETs, in other cases positive uh, ETs trying to give a, a more spiritual uh, message possibly. Um, other people would say that this is an easy formation to hoax, you know, it's just made up of loads of lines and squares, whatever. But actually it's much more complex than that. There are 1,600 squares and oblongs of standing crop, which comes up to about here, uh, top of your hip or thigh, 
Um, and in fact, if you draw a line on that um, through the middle, um, you'll actually see, um, say through the middle here, if you, draw, if you draw a line and actually fold that formation um, like a piece of paper, the, the squares in the bottom right-hand corner and the pins around it will actually fit into um, the areas, the clear areas on the left, very much like a plug going into a socket. And if you draw a line through the, through the centre and then do the same going upwards, again, it'll actually plug into the opposite. This is, this is ludicrously complex. Now, talking of silicon chip, of course, uh, you're all very familiar with Colonel Phil Corso, um, who's acknowledged that he worked for the Research and Development Department at the Pentagon in 61, 63, and was involved in back engineering UFO technology from Roswell uh, to seed into mainstream industry through government contracting programs. Um, of course, from which came, so we're told, and I do believe, things like silicon chip, fiber optics, night vision, Kevlar, body armor, uh, lasers, things like that. Now, this is the paradox that we live in. We have um, uh, these sort of two realities. The one where we're told this stuff is real, um, that much of our modern technology comes, is derived from this technology. Things like computers, mobile phones, uh, sat nav, all this stuff. And yet, there's mainstream society that doesn't even necessarily even believe in UFOs and ETs. Um, but I feel that we are coming to the time now, and this is being very clearly shown this week, that these two sort of areas are definitely going to merge together. <coughs> the um, balls of light have been associated with crop formation creation for many years now. And um, there are many people who photographed and filmed these balls of light flying around the, uh, the fields and the formations. Uh, one bit of footage, which you may have seen, um, shows four of these balls of light flying around a field and then a formation um, at a place called Oliver's Castle just um, collapsing underneath uh, these balls of light within a matter of seconds. And then two of these balls actually fly through um, a hedgerow across another field and through another hedgerow. Now, we saw the original footage only a few days after it appeared, and um, this is when you could see this happening with the balls of light going through the hedges. But most of the footage after that, when this was debunked, um, they'd actually clipped that, so you didn't see the fullness of what was really going on. And from our research, you know, I truly believe that this is genuine footage, and it fits with the fact that the formations appear really quickly in a matter of seconds. Um, but, uh, but also, th the important point is to note that the actual balls of light flew through the hedge with no diminishing in their speed, so that they have the ability to go through matter, um, you know, without affecting it in any way. Um, now, you're, on the other hand, of course, you're familiar also with the orbs, these sort of very fine, opaque balls of light that people have been taking images of, certainly since the mid-90s onwards. Now, initially, again, with ordinary film and ordinary cameras, so this isn't just a digital sort of revolution as people think it is. Um, and, you know, discounting things like dust and water droplets, snowflakes, light refraction, the research has shown, or people believe, that these are actually photographs of spirits in the dimension, the next dimension over. Um, this is a picture that was taken in a place that was very badly haunted. Uh, they were doing renovation work in it, and um, it actually stimulated a lot of poltergeist activity. So up on the top left, those two orbs that are up there, I believe, are uh, images of ghosts, basically. And this is the, how the research shows that they are possibly ghosts spirits, uh, often people doing meditation or healings, there'll be balls of light around them um, as though they're actually guides or guardian angels even. So this, but this is a slightly different phenomena than the, the balls of light that are being seen in relation to the crop formations. Now this is a, a huge formation that appeared um, up at a place called Milk Hill, up on top of this hill uh, at Alton Barnes in Wiltshire. Um, this is about 800 feet across and now this is stepping up to a six-fold geometry. You know, you had the, the, the single spiral, the three, three-fold, and now a six-fold spiral, made up of either equilateral triangles or a hexagon or a Star of David even, spiraling out. Um, it's a massive formation. In fact, it's so big that the media, uh, particularly in the West, were actually quite complimentary about this uh, because they realized that you just couldn't create something as big as that in just a few hours of darkness. Um, and in the UK, you know, in the summer, there are literally only a few, literally only a few hours. Now, just to give you an idea of how big this formation actually is, 
um, it was estimated that you would have to create each one of those circles, because there are over 400 of them, each one of those you'd have to create in about 30 seconds. Um, so just to give you an idea of how hard that would be, if you look at the central circle right in the middle, that is a picture that I took within the central circle only. Um, the camera's at about 12 foot up, raised on a, on a tripod, looking down. And you can see that's just the central circle. And then on the left, you've got one of the arms going out, and on the right is a second arm going out. But also from that, you can see that the field is not flat. Um, it undulates. Uh, in the middle, it dips. And on the right-hand side, the field actually drops over the edge. So these are not flat canvases by any means. In fact, it's only when you go in them you realise that you know, they can be on sloping fields, uh, the ground can be very wet and um, you get sort of clay and, and chalk sticking to the bottom of your boots. Um, it's, uh, it, it is not a flat canvas. Now, after we'd been into this particular formation, uh, we then dropped uh, to the right down below there to the place called the East Field. And there was a formation in there which we were going into. And just as we got there, it was just getting dark. And um, so as we went in, um, while we were in there, my wife felt um, psychically that there was a presence in the formation with us. So I took a photograph, this is with an ordinary camera with ordinary film, not digital, and it actually, on the, it actually came out with this orb of light. Now she'd psychically seen this presence as an orb, showing as an orb, so it's incredible that it actually took that quite dense orb you see towards the top there. Um, once again, I felt that this was a spirit and this was not part of this technology uh, which has been seen and photographed, yet flying around the fields, often dropping into the formations, as though it's part of an observational technology or as well as a creative technology. But as I say, these things I think are slightly different. Now talking of orbs, um, this is a picture that I actually took in uh, Rendlesham Forest. Um, you see the orb in the middle there. Um, this was, um, I took this picture last year in March of 2008. Uh, now, you're familiar with Rendlesham. This is probably the, the site of the most important UFO case in, in Britain, really, um, where in December 1980, over a few-day period, um, at the, next to the joint US military bases of Bentwaters and Woodbridge, uh, a lot of military personnel had these interactions with UFOs, uh, triangular craft, um, balls of light, and also ET beings as well. And you no doubt know Colonel Charles Hull, um, the military policeman Larry Warren and of course Staff Sergeant Jim Penniston. These people are involved in this case. So many people go there now to, to look at the various sites that are related to this particular incident. And in fact there's so many now that they've actually set up this UFO trail there in the forest, which is quite nice, of the Forestry Commission, bless them. Um, but what is interesting is that I took um, many pictures within that area and the only one that actually came out with an orb was this one here right at the alleged landing site where this triangular craft actually landed and those posts mark the supposed landing site. What is even more interesting is if you notice on the left the, um, it, it came up with this incredibly beautiful cross of light and I do believe the actual it's a single motion of light starting off on the right going off screen and then probably coming down and finishing down at the bottom there. Um, you know, with these slight pulsations of light as it goes. Now, this picture was taken at a 60th of a second, so again, that was pretty fast motion, uh, but a beautiful image as well. And there's been a lot of um, paranormal activity that's gone on in Rendlesham since then as well, over the years, so something really strange and unusual is happening at Rendlesham. Now, this is a beautiful picture um, that I took in an island called Madeira, um, which is in the Atlantic off... Um, southwest uh, Portugal, uh, last September 2008. Um, it's a beautiful place. And we were, we were at a particular location um, where the topography really reminded us of, um, of Tepetzlan, where Carlos Diaz comes from. And while we were there, we were saying, you know, how amazing it would be if we could actually see something like uh, the plasma craft, like the orangey uh, yellow craft that I showed earlier on. Um, you know, such a beautiful object, and it would be really lovely to see something like that. So we were amazed. The very next place that I stopped, um, I took a photograph, and you can see this object over on the right. Um, that um, here, this, and in fact, the line below it is part of the uh, the mountain beyond. Now we didn't see this with our eyes. There were no balloons. There were no cables or anything like that. But it came up with this really unusual sort of organic. Um, type possibly technology um, in the valley across the uh, in, you know in the middle of the valley and um, what was 
incredible for us, of course, is that it was like an acknowledgement of our heartfelt desire to see something like the plasma craft, and we end up taking a picture of this really unusual sort of um, biological form. Now, following on from that theme, uh, this is a picture that was taken by uh, Billy Meyer on the 3rd of March, 1975, uh, where he was taking a picture of a UFO when suddenly it's as though a second UFO appeared. Um, and it was as though it's coming in from the other dimension, in effect, um, either through a sort of a doorway, interdimensional doorway, or with um, a, a sort of a doorway of light. Now, I, I show these particular last few images because I think it's really important that we understand the interdimensional nature of reality. And um, I think that's even more important now with the things that are coming up in the future. If we don't understand that there is this interdimensional aspect, which of course is not only spiritual, but also even UFO technology as well, it'll make it harder for us to grasp what's going on and where this is leading in the near future. <coughs> now, over the years, the crop formations have um, been giving images that basically are for everybody, for the whole planet. Um, and they cover, as well as geometry and mathematics, they cover different belief systems as well, as though they're a bridge-making process to try and get everybody to come together. Uh, this is a picture taken at Barbary Castle in Wiltshire, um, in the canola, or the rape crop, um, the yellow crop, and this is actually uh, the tree of life from the Kabbalah. So again, it's like different belief systems are out there, and including this one as well. This is a picture by Francine Blake, um, it's a huge form. You can see up at the top there's a couple of people in there, look. Um, and um, this is actually a very powerful image within the Native American tradition that relates to revelation, so as in a revealing. Um, so, you know, all peoples are being catered for in, this, in these particular forms. And, of course, just before this appeared in 1998 near Alton Barnes, and just a few years before that in 94, you had the birth of the white buffalo calf, which was a major sign for the, um, for the native peoples in America um, that sort of said, we are in this incredible time of revelation. So you're also having them in the crop formations as well to acknowledge that. Now this formation appeared at a place called Chur Hill, which is um, again in that Mecca area where many of these formations appear, uh, just down the road from uh, the Avebury Stone Circle, Stonehenge, Silbury Hill. Um, but if you look to the right, where you've got the white horse in chalk up on the hill, and to the right of that, just off screen, is an obelisk. Now that obelisk marks the very spot where Marconi sent his first radio transmissions uh, back in 1898 in the UK. So it's as though, again, the crop formations are acknowledging the fact that they are a communication, um, uh, as radio transmissions were, a sort of a communication from a distance. It's as though it's the same sort of thing, trying to acknowledge that we are communicating with you. Um, and of course, that became very clear uh, when in 2000, um, there was an amazing formation next to this radio telescope. Uh, this is at Chill Bolton, south of Andover in Hampshire, in southern England. Um, now, you know the SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, um, and of course the whole point of that program is to use radio telescopes to listen for signals from space to show that there is an advanced intelligence out there communicating with us. And yet, of course, we're told by the SETI program that uh, they've never received a message, and therefore, in other words, there's nothing out there, so go back to sleep again. Um, but in this in sublime way in relation to the crop formations, the message is actually coming into the fields of the world so the people of the world can see it rather than it going into the radio telescopes. So as if to acknowledge that fact, and perhaps some cosmic humour as well, maybe, um, right next to this telescope in August of 2000, this formation appeared. Now, the uh, telescope is on government land, and then right next to it on that field, you had this formation here which seemed to mimic the dish of the radio telescope um, and the antenna in the middle and this sort of cosmic or planetary stuff on the outside. Uh, that's a close-up of that, so you can see. Again, very much like the dish and the, of the radio telescope in the middle and this sort of cosmic planetary type communication. So this was in August 2000, and it's as though it was the initial way of showing what you're expecting is to receive messages in the t radio telescopes. What we'll actually do is we'll put them in the fields of the world so that everybody can see them. So. Then, over the next two years, this message stepped up to even higher levels. And virtually to the day, the following year later, in the same place in the field, then appeared these two formations. Um, you can see the radio telescope in the bottom right-hand corner. 
Uh, up at the top, you have um, what is like a face, a human or humanoid face. And then on the left, pointing straight at the telescope, you have a formation that relates to um, a, a binary code message that was sent by the SETI program back in November 1974 into space. So initially, if you look at the face, um, that's a sort of upside down image, but it gives you an idea. If you squint your eyes at that, actually, it brings out a much more three-dimensional image, where again, you can clearly see the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the chin, and the ears. And yet, this is just uh, made up of hundreds of circles of standing crop. Um, you know, it's from the ground, you haven't got a clue what that is. And here's an idea, just across one corner there. Uh, hundreds of circles ranging from about a foot across to four feet across, where the crop again is coming up to the top of your hip or your thigh. Um, so when you're within it, looking across, as you can imagine, you can't see what that is at all. Um, it's only when you see the aerial overview that you suddenly realise you've got an image, very much like a dot matrix in newspaper, um, you know, just dots on, on white space. But also with this, you can see that the crop flows as well um, in this sort of area here. Um, the crop is not cut, it's not damaged, it's literally flowing around these circles. Now, the other formation is this one, and um, this is about 250 feet in length, made up of hundreds of squares and oblongs of standing crop. Um, but it actually creates this, um, it, or is based on this particular message that was sent from the Arecibo Radio Observatory in uh, November 1974 as a message, as a communication into space. And just to give you an idea of that, um, so you've got an idea of the translation of it, on the right is the translation and on the left is a block form so you can actually compare to the crop formation in a second. But um, as you look at the message on the right, um, you can see here, you know, at the bottom you have a little mini graphic of the Arecibo radio telescope with the dish and the antenna. Um, above that, you have the, um, what is the, the planetary system with the third planet raised up, uh, planet Earth, the planet with life. Above that, you have a human figure. Uh, and then you have the DNA double helix, number of nucleotides in DNA, formulas for sugars and bases in nucleotides of DNA, atomic numbers for oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, etc. It's basically an intelligent binary code communication into space. Now, if you look at the block form on the left here, um, which is here, and then zigzag backwards and forwards, looking at the two of them, you'll actually see that they are very similar, but there are some anomalies. And, of course, the anomalies are the classic communication. Um, as an, one example, of course, is the DNA structure is different. And um, we're all familiar with the fact that the hybrid program is um, using human genetic material with ET genetic material to create a new race and the DNA structure is different. Uh, but also even it's acknowledged some research is showing that even the star children may have a different DNA structure. Uh, below that you have the human figure um, on the right and on the left here you have what is like a, a, an image of a grey. It's um, a little body with a large cranium and the big eyes. Below that you have the um, um, the planetary system where instead of just the Earth raised up, um, a planet with life, next to that you've got Mars and of course we're very familiar with the fact that Mars is showing that it used to have vast rivers, lakes and oceans on it. Um, uh, photographs from the Viking orbiter from 76 onwards are showing what looks like vegetation on Mars um, that seems to grow in the summer and contract in the winter and of course the Cydonia area where it looks as though there are pyramidal structures which many geologists believe are not created by natural wind erosion. These are artificial structures. Then of course you've got the four little dots after that um, which are probably relating to the Galilean moons around Jupiter and certainly many microbiologists believe that under the ice uh, moon of Europa there may well be life underneath. But the pièce de résistance of this particular formation is the, um, at the bottom where you have like a little mini graphic of the formation that appeared there year, the year before um, with uh, the dish and the radio telescope in the middle with this sort of planetary stuff going on the outside. Now the original message in the same location showed the Arecibo telescope as though acknowledging this is where this is sent from. Uh, other researchers feel that what the, the actual crop formation message is trying to tell us is <coughs> that ETs are already here, which of course we know they, they indeed they are. 
Now, this is stepped up to a new level. Again, this is going beyond geometry and mathematics. Uh, this is a, a direct SETI-like communication, but in the crops of the world. So as if that wasn't enough, then the following year, virtually to the day again, in August of 2002, just eight miles down the road, under a bank of microwave towers, appeared this incredible formation. Now this is about 350 feet in length, <coughs> and just off screen at the top is uh, this bank of microwave towers. And of course SETI are looking into uh, the microwave spectrum as well as the radio spectrum. Um, right up at the top, you, I don't know if you can actually see, uh, there's a little car right up there, just to give you an idea of the size of these formations. Um, and this is stepping to the sort of a three-dimensional, photographically real uh, image. Uh, again, if you squint slightly, it really brings out a 3D effect. It's so amazing, even though it's just made up of, of lines of um, uh, depressed crop, um, that if you look on his cheek, the right-hand uh, side of his cheek, which is the shadow side, um, it's even darker than some of the other surrounding areas of the crop. Um, it's highlighting that fact, so it really is like an actual photograph. Um, the three areas on the right are possibly UFOs hovering in the distance. And as you can see, it's as though he's holding up a disc. Now, this appeared around about the 25th anniversary of the Voyager probe, which was the one that went out with that golden disc on board, with people speaking, music playing, uh, children talking. So a lot of people felt that it was trying to communicate with us uh, using a disc. Now, a lot of people feel that this is circles, but it's not. It's actually a spiral of flowing crop that starts in the center um, and flows in an anti-clockwise direction and eventually comes out um, at the bottom uh, there. <clears throat> now, I walked that, um, and it's on a sloping field, quite steeply sloping. And it took me about 15 or 20 minutes to walk the spiral, which, if you straightened that out, would be the equivalent of about a mile in length. Now, try to do a spiral on a computer is really hard, but on a sloping field at night, a mile in length, uh, is virtually impossible. But even more than that is, if you notice the dark areas, um, they are all standing crop, again, about this high. Uh, the light areas are the areas where the crop has been laid down, but it's not ha haphazard. They're actually, all of them, all point into the center. Wherever you are within the spiral, they're all facing into the center. So it's incredibly complex. So some people looking at that thinking, this is a disk, you know, what does it say? So using the ASCII code in the computer, they actually um, uh, translated that into an actual message. And this is what it supposedly says. Beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, but still time. Believe there is good out there. We oppose deception, conduit closing. Now these are really powerful words. And, in fact, there are many people who believe that uh, the greys are going to help us as we go through this technological and environmental collapse that's coming up. Um, other people feel that the greys, in fact, are the classic deceivers, as it says in the message. Um, and that, um, you know, they're, they're taking our genetic material from behind the scenes or possibly even manipulating things as well uh, from behind the scenes. So I personally would go along with the latter. I would not trust these guys. Now, this is a formation that appeared uh, the following year in 2003 at a place called Golden Ball Hill, which is an interesting term, um, which was actually um, the representation of an egg and, and a sperm. And if some people felt it was referring to the creative life force. Other people felt that it was also referring to this sort of the, the genetic manipulation that's going on by the ET um, side of things behind the scenes. Um, now, what is really interesting is that some of the BLT research has actually shown that there are energy signatures around some of the crop formations which are the same as the energy signatures they find around um, cattle and, and animal mutilation sites as well. So that's really interesting information. Okay. Now, at the 2006 Loughran Conference, uh, Jaime Maussan and Santiago Atiria Garza gave an excellent presentation um, as they did yesterday, amazing, um, on much of the activity in Mexico. Um, but one of the things they showed back then was something that hadn't been seen before. And this was uh, film footage and CCTV footage of, uh, which was taken in Mexico and in the UK at the end of uh, 2005 of what looked like an opening um, wormhole or uh, interdimensional portal which is actually uh, appearing in the sky. <coughs> 
Now, for myself, from about 1997 onwards, uh, many times in the si sky I've seen these uh, night sky, these sort of very bright single pulses of light. Um, it's, not a, it's not a meteor, I don't think it's a tumbling satellite, it's just literally a single very bright pulse, a uh, fraction of a second. But this was something really new, this was different, this was a spiralling vortex or interdimensional portal opening in the sky. But it, what is really interesting is that that following season in the crop formations, it's as though that particular theme was, was mirrored in some of the formations when you had things like this. Um, this again is a huge formation, um, beautifully placed within the landscape, uh, one of Steve Alexander's pictures there. Um, where again, this is just literally arcs of standing crop and yet um, it creates this beautiful 3D sort of, again, like an, an opening wormhole or sort of interdimensional portal. Another one uh, was this one by uh, Lucy Pringle that shows once again you have these sort of the two much more three-dimensional looking ones and then the others which are uh, much more flat, much more uh, sort of uh, well, 2D. For myself, I actually believe the 2D ones are meant to re represent our dimension and that we, are ne we need to start to become aware of these other dimensions beyond this, particularly in relation to the fact that the, you know, it's believed that the, um, the veil is thinning and our frequency is rising, that the dimensions are merging. And I think that's part of why the orbs are starting. We're starting to see the orbs as well. Um, so this is perhaps acknowledging that fact. So what was amazing is this appeared at a place called um, Savernake, which is near Marlborough in Wiltshire. And we were leaving, after we'd been into this formation, we were leaving by that tram line there, uh, heading back towards the road. Um, and as we, just before we got to the road, we both looked left, and there's a huge forest next to it called Savonate Forest. And as we were watching, um, it's suddenly as though the whole forest itself started to diminish, um, uh, morph away, going into the distance. We both looked at each other and said, can you see that? And we both said, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was literally sort of stretching away and the only th way I can describe it is sometimes in Hollywood movies you see somebody walking down a corridor or something and the, the corridor seems to stretch using some sort of photographic technology. It was like that, it seemed to shift away from us. Um, but in a way for, for us it was like an acknowledgement of the fact that we were liaising with these formations that are relating to interdimensional reality. It's as that was actually a shift of the material world as we looked at it. Now I've been going into crop formations for at least 14 seasons now and I've never seen anything like that so it's really really unusual. And this is a beautiful formation that appeared in uh, on the, um, the 4th of August 2003 and it's known as the Swallows Formation for obvious reasons. Um, and um, <coughs> it's, um, the Swallows of course are the birds that, um, that fly along uh, still water taking either insects or water. Uh, ponds, lakes, uh, rivers, and you get these sort of droplets of water that come off their beak or their wings. Um, but it was beautiful the way it was within the landscape. Um, you can see in the middle it's actually sort of dipping down. And from this appeared at um, below Milk Hill in Alton Barnes in Wiltshire. And there's a big white horse on the hill and we were standing there looking down at that. And it literally was as though the birds were flying into the dip um, and then flying back out the other side. It was beautiful. Many people felt that there was a, a, a real organic message and that uh, we need to really care for Mother Earth um, from that particular formation. Um, now, you're all familiar, of course, with the, um, the story of Noah and um, after the biblical flood, this global flood that basically destroyed a, an ancient, advanced civilization. Um, after the sort of the water settled, Noah from the ship released a dove uh, for the dove to try and find land. In other words, if it didn't return, it would have found land. And um, so we all know that story. Now, in the Sumerian texts, particularly those highlighted by Zechariah Sitchin, the um, uh, Noah is called Utnapishtim. And in that, he actually releases not only a dove, but also a swallow. So again, there are people who feel, uh, as I do, that the, the, the point of the swallow formation was trying to highlight not only the swallow but the water aspect of it, as though highlighting, a, making a connection to that sort of biblical flood type thing. Uh, which of course is very relevant, as we know, with the things that are happening around the world at the moment. Um, this is a beautiful painting called There's a Storm Coming, and indeed there is. Um, the pole caps, the glaciers, the permafrost are starting to melt now so fast uh, that they're having a major effect on sea level rise and of course on the ocean circulation as well. And we're starting to see effects of that with things like uh, Hurricane Katrina, with New Orleans, where you get these vast tidal surges. 
uh, low-lying countries like Bangladesh and uh, the Maldives, etc. Um, so this is something we've got to um, start addressing as we go through these next few years. Um, the effect that these tidal surges and global superstorms are going to have on some of the major cities of the world, uh, which are going to start to cause economic collapse and then the redistribution of the human populace as well. Um, and I mentioned earlier that you know, I feel we're in the time of preparation. Uh, we need to be aware of those things. But in a way, what's worse is the fact that uh, not only there's some of the major cities that are by uh, rivers or by the sea, um, but also, of course, most of the world's nuclear power stations are also uh, by the sea, where they use the seawater to cool the reactors. Um, this is a picture of a place, uh, a nuclear power station called Hinkley Point, which is only about 15 miles away from where I live in Somerset. <laughs> and you can actually see, this is just a normal high tide level, and it's already starting to erode the bank here. Um, and in fact, they've shored it up with this metal cage with rocks in it. So with these tidal surges, which can reach something like 25 feet above normal high tide level, spring tides and storms, um, the future is looking bleak as far as um, the effect that this is going to have on nuclear power stations and, and uh, nuclear waste. So we have a problem coming up, and that's part of these things that need to be addressed seriously um, as we look at what's going on in this near future. Okay. <clears throat> now, I mentioned earlier um, that I had a UFO encounter in April 1973. Uh, that stimulated me to start looking at the UFO reality from that early age. Um, but it wasn't really until the early 90s where I suddenly began to realise that possibly there was a synchronicity about the fact that it actually occurred as I was returning from my confirmation into the church. So from that time, I started to look at, um, uh, look more into... Um, certainly the sort of biblical interactions that seem to have happened and these ancient interactions as well. Um, and, you know, the more you look into it, you see things like uh, Genesis 6 speaks about the sons of the gods marrying the daughters of men and having offspring. Um, the Ezekiel in the Old Testament has some very interesting encounters with unusual people and objects that come to and from the sky. Of course, the, the ancient Hindu Vedas... Um, um, speak about the fact that the gods used to come to and from the earth in the Vamana, the flying craft of the sky. And most of the indigenous people of the world all believe that we've always had interactions with the star nation people. So with that in mind, in January 1995, I went to Israel to look at some of the ancient sites, um, and particularly the biblical sites. And I was truly amazed when I came across this particular building this is the beautiful memorial church that's built above the ruins of the house of St. Peter at uh, Capernaum in Galilee. And it really looks like a flying saucer, uh, a UFO. It's got the classic ramp-like stairs on the right here. Um, it's got windows giving great views all around. In the belly of the, uh, the church, there's a hole through which you can see the ruins of the house below. And then it's actually hovering above the ruins on these legs that look sort of a bit like energy, really. This is a picture from the side where you can actually see that. Um, again, a very di it's a disc-shaped, well, it's a church, but it doesn't really look like one. Um, you've got the classic ramp-like stairs, um, the windows, and again, the ruins are below, and it's sort of hovering on these legs that look a bit like energy, as though it's literally hovering above. Now, this picture was taken in June of 1990 at the inauguration of the building. So it's a modern building. And on the right, you have... Uh, Father Virgilio Corbo, who is the Franciscan monk that discovered the ruins of the House of St. Peter. And on the left is the architect, Ildo Aveta, um, who actually comes from Rome and is, um, has done many commissions for the Catholic Church and the Vatican, interestingly enough. There may be a connection. Then you have this uh, image from the side, where again, it looks very much like a UFO. Um, in fact, it looks even metallic, even though it's made of stone and concrete. Um, but again, on the right, you can see the sort of the ramp-like stairs coming down, and it's hovering above these ruins. Now, in late 1999, I wrote an article about this that appeared in the International UFO Press, um, where I said, I believe this is probably one of the most important buildings on the planet. Now, because to me, it's a classic bridge maker that allows us to connect with the uh, things that have happened in the past, where the gods with a little g came to and from the earth, um, and interacted with the human race, but also as well the spiritual side of it as well. You know, um, spiritual reality, the angelic realms, Christ, of course, in the past, and God. 
uh, and this modern era that we're in now, where we are becoming more and more aware of um, the modern UFO and ET reality as an absolute reality. There's a spiritual sort of awakening going on globally, but a cosmic reality. Um, and as I say, this interlinked ufology as well, but also the recognition of the spirit, the true spiritual nature, uh, angelic realms, Christ and God as well. So it's a classic bridge maker that connects all these areas together. Um, and of course this is addressed by people like um, Monsignor Carrara Balducci of the Vatican uh, Commission looking into the UFO and ET reality that acknowledges that um, ETs are real, they're physical beings, uh, but we also need to understand there is the spiritual dimension as well. Um, so I was truly amazed when in April of 2001, repeated again in March of 2002, the BBC, which is one of the main TV networks in the UK, um, produced a serious theological documentary entitled um, The Son of God. Now this was presented by the Middle East correspondent Jeremy Bowen, a, a serious theological documentary looking at the lives of the apostles and of Christ, what he may, have, may, may not have looked like. Um, and in the second program they actually showed this site and he looked at the building and said that its design is very controversial. It obscures the ruins and looks like a flying saucer. These are words you don't often hear in, in the UK, in the BBC, particularly in relation to theological stuff. Then he went inside the building, up the ramp-like stairs, into the sort of the belly inside, looked through the, um, uh, the hole down at the ruins below and said, thanks to the archaeologists' discoveries and to modern technology, we can beam down to first century Capernaum. And with that, um, in this serious documentary, they actually showed a computer animation of this church taking off like a, a UFO, flying around the site and then flying off above our heads. I mean, you wouldn't have believed it if you hadn't seen it. So with the permission of the BBC, I've taken some images from that just to show you. Um, here, this is from the television, um, and this is the church, and suddenly the legs sort of, the energy rises up, and then literally this is a church starts taking off. Lights are on there, there's a blue beam of light underneath, and then the sequence of this, this flying church uh, in Israel, it flies around the site and then comes back round here and then flies off above our heads. Uh, again, if you hadn't have seen it, you wouldn't believe it had actually occurred. But of course the BBC, the same as many other um, international media, are often present at these global conferences, but particularly disclosures like the one in 2001 and 2007 at the National Press Club. Uh, so they're fully aware of this reality. But for me, I took this as a, a, a quite a nice little disclosure, so particularly linking in that theological side as well. So, when we start to put these things together, all the things that are happening around the world, um, you have certainly on the more negative side the, uh, the environmental crisis that we're in and that will increase. Um, we're all starting to become uh, sick and tired of warfare because it's becoming very obvious it's manufactured. Uh, we're understanding who really runs this world and what their agenda is. Um, and all of these sort of pollutive aspects that are going on as well. Um, and yet at the same time as we head towards this real crisis point, technologically, environmentally, there are these incredible things happening. Um, the crop formations, the um, uh, people waking up to this sort of cosmic reality as well and um, spiritual reality. So it's becoming fairly clear um, that we are in a time very much like Revelation where we truly understand what's going on here. And of course Revelation is a revealing. And it's only right that we truly find out who we are, why we exist, why we're here, where we're going. These are the great questions. So if this is the time of Revelation, which I believe it is, um, then um, that is also the time when the prophesied return of the New Jerusalem occurs. And of course we're seeing the fulfillment of many other prophecies as well. Um, so just a quote from Revelation 21.10, it says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. So in other words, again, he was at a high point, John, and he's seeing this object come from heaven to earth or from space to earth. Um, now, again, this is describing something f coming from the sky rather than is often depicted in um, sort of medieval paintings of an earthbound New Jerusalem made up of cobbled streets and um, uh, sort of bricks and mortar. 
It's literally this crystalline, exquisite crystalline object that comes from heaven to earth, from space. Um, now, this painting was uh, painted in early um, 1996. In late 1996, uh, there was a meeting, um, sorry, prior to that, in um, October, September, October of 1996, uh, the UK's UFO magazine um, had an article in the Space and Astronomy section uh, by Andrew Pike, which was titled, Heavens Above. Now, it said this, it probably comes as no surprise to learn NASA have several hundred unreleased photographs from the Hubble Space Telescope. Rumours are currently circulating in the world of astronomy that one taken on the 26th of March 1996 uh, and being held back shows a white city of massive proportions just floating in deep space reminiscent of heaven. Uh, one NASA spokesman said maybe the will of God pointed the telescope in that direction. It seems that President Clinton, Vice President Al Gore and Pope John Paul II are all being kept updated. So. Later on that year, in December of 1996, there was a meeting at the White House called the Origins Meeting, where leading theological figures and NASA officials met to discuss the fingerprints of God and the fingerprints of life, respectively. Just after that, um, the Vatican started spending millions of dollars upgrading its telescope array at Tucson, Arizona, just down the road. Um, and then in 1997 onwards, you have Monsignor Corrado Baducci of the Vatican Commission speaking out um, in global media, particularly in Italy, um, about the fact that there is a Vatican Commission looking into UFOs and ETs and that they exist. Um, then in early 1999, Pope John Paul II uh, goes to Mexico City on a papal mission. And uh, when he's there, he sees the silver spheres, the uh, flotillas uh, in Mexico. And later on that year, in December of 1999, he actually sends his blessings to a large UFO conference that was being held in Acapulco in Mexico um, to the speakers and the organisers of that conference. So in other words, he's acknowledging that this stuff is real. Um, he just can't necessarily talk about it in the mainstream media. So behind the scenes, there's this amazing sort of clamour going on. Um, now in January 2003, my wife and I went to uh, the National Space Centre in the UK at Leicester where a group called Euroceti, now Interceti, were showing images that had been downloaded from the SOHO satellite, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, that's taking pictures of the sun and the coronal mass ejections. And they had actually got images of these large objects in deep space. Um, and one of them looks very much like this. And that is here. Um, so much so, in fact, that they actually dubbed it the Disney UFO because it, they, they felt that it looked like the Disney castle, you know, with the sort of the, the spires. Um, now, again, this is an incredible image. Whether this is that white city of um, huge proportions that NASA photographed uh, or New Jerusalem, I don't know. But if something like this were to appear in these end days, it would have a profound effect on millions of people around the world. Um, and so many of the prophecies are now being fulfilled. Now, um, one of the most powerful images in cinematic history, to me, is from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, in relation to this, of course, when that huge uh, city ship comes over the tower. Uh, amazing. But the actual aspect is the, um, where they're in northern India, and thousands of people are, are running up that hill, um, singing those five immortal musical notes, and pointing up at the sky from where the sound came. Now that, of course, is made up of um, thousands, or in reality, will be made up of thousands of uh, Buddhists and Hindus and non-religious people affected by something that they've seen. Um, for myself, for many, many years, I've been speaking to community groups and organisations um, in the UK trying to raise awareness of these various subjects. And um, because of that, I've had so many people come to me to, uh, to relay their own personal uh, UFO and even ET experiences. And this, these are people often, you know, from military, uh, military pilots, commercial airline pilots, people like that. One of them was a lady who worked for the Royal Air Force in the 1950s in their research and development department. And she said she was actually, she had many experiences, but one of them, she was in Singapore, and she said she came out of the hotel she was staying at, and as she came out, people on the streets were kneeling down, praying and looking up at the sky. So she looked up, 
and up above was this huge um, cylindrical metallic silver looking cigar shaped object with windows all along the side. This had a really moving effect on her. Um, and again here in Singapore you would have had Muslims, um, Buddhists, non-religious people as well, all affected by something they were seeing. And um, you know, to me this is really important because it does affect people in a, on a sort of a soul level, a heart level, and goes beyond uh, religious boundaries to affecting the person on an individual level. Uh, this certainly, of course, applies in Mexico. Um, you're all familiar with the, um, the Masters of the Stars incident and um, <clears throat> how so much film footage and photographs of UFOs in Mexico. Um, but to me, one of the more profound images, in a way, is um, where there are hundreds or thousands of people in the street, all, again, looking up in the skies in a very calm, a very peaceful way. They're not running around screaming, pulling their hair out, as we, ex we, we are led to believe through the media. Um, they're very calm and peaceful. And in fact, um, after a short while, if they have to, they go about their, their, their daily business as well. But I think these are important things to be highlighted because you know, with the changes that are coming up, it shows that people generally are very calm and peaceful and honourable about, about these sort of realities. Now, you know the, uh, the Masters of the Stars incident, which um, during that total solar eclipse over Mexico on the 11th of July 1991, um, um, where as, as the eclipse occurred, UFOs appeared in the skies over Mexico. But it was only after it occurred that it realized it fulfilled that 1200 year old man prophecy that said on the birth of that particular sun, the Masters of the Stars would return to Earth to herald the dawn of a new age of cosmic awareness and of earth changes. And of course, since that time, 91, the crop formations have become more and more complex. Um, people are waking up to this much bigger reality. And of course, we are having the earth changes, we, as we mentioned earlier, starting to see these incredible earth changes. Um, so this sort of prophecy is, is acknowledging the fact that, um, you know, certainly the, um, the relevance of the December 2012 date may well be a real um, sort of a transitional point because these prophecies are all being fulfilled. Now, again, Jaime Maussan has certainly spoken about this before, but it is important to stress um, how within the crop formations um, these messages are being given. It's, again, it goes beyond geometry and mathematics. And um, this formation and the next one I'll show you appeared in 2005 right next to a, a sacred burial site called um, Wayland Smithy, um, east of Swindon in Wiltshire. And um, when Jaime had these translated into... Um, uh, Mayan, they were so powerful that he flew immediately straight over from Mexico to look at these. Um, this one, when he had this translated, relates to the, um, the alignment of Earth in, on the 21st of uh, December 2012. Uh, the alignment of Earth with the Sun, with the Pleiades star system and the galactic center. But it also has information that relates to the annular eclipse of the 20th of May 2012, which will be seen over Mexico the transit of Venus over the Sun on the 6th of June 2012, but also is a possible bridge maker once again between um, like Christianity, Islam and uh, the native peoples of the world as well, uh, which is the whole point of what the crop formations are trying to do. Uh, the next formation, this one here, stunning formation, uh, probably 300 odd feet across. Um, the information within that, uh, translated, relates to the return of Quetzalcoatl, the return of the Messiah, uh, second coming of Christ in other words, and within it are the words Christ, Messiah, catastrophe, eclipse, life and God. Very powerful, powerful words. Now in um, 1995 this formation appeared in uh, near Petersfield in Hampshire and is known as the orbits formation for obvious reasons. It shows the orbits of the inner planets around the Sun uh, where you have Mercury, then uh, Venus, then um, the Earth, Mars, the asteroid belt, before you then go on to Jupiter and beyond. Now, there's a couple of interesting points about this. One is that the orbits themselves are in standing crop rather than indented crop, which is harder to hoax. But secondly, if you notice the third orbit, which is the orbit of the Sun, I'm uh, sorry, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, uh, you'll notice it doesn't actually show a planet. And um, you know, many people started to question, what's it trying to say? Some people felt that it was trying to highlight the fact that we are heading towards an extinction level event um, on, in an environmental sense. Other people felt that what it was trying to show was the fact that the Earth herself 
is about to go through a transformation process, very much like an ascension process that happened to Christ, where she will actually go to a higher dimensional uh, uh, realm beyond this, so you wouldn't be able to see her on the third dimensional realm. Uh, of course, that's a debate that ranges within the crop formation uh, fraternity, but um, these are the sort of messages that are coming out from the crops. Now, going back to 2005, this formation appeared as well, um, and it actually, in the centre, it looks like uh, three triangles, but actually it's um, uh, three sevens. And the numeric 777 as a unity uh, denotes the ascension process. Uh, and then again, you've got this sort of uh, the Mayan aspect around the outside. So once again, you know, the feeling is it's trying to point to the fact that the planet is about to go through this transformation as well. Uh, um, this sort of change that's coming up is a really important spiritual transformation. And then this huge formation appeared in July of 2007. Um, this is massive. It's about 1,000 feet across by 500 feet in width. And in fact, um, you can see up here, up in the, up in the top left-hand corner, there are a couple of people walking down the tram line. So you have an idea of the size of these. Um, it wasn't, again, on a flat canvas. It was actually on a field that undulated and then dropped down to the right. So it's, it's a lot more complicated than it actually looks. Um, but if you look at that from the bottom right-hand side, looking in that direction, uh, where it looks a bit like a number three, it's actually based on the OM symbol. And, of course, the OM relates to the total consciousness of God. Everything there ever was, is, and shall be. Uh, also to sort of waking consciousness, sleeping and dreaming consciousness. In other words, everything that there ever has been. Um, and this formation, when it appeared, it appeared during the middle of the night, in just those few hours of darkness, there was a huge flash of light that illuminated the whole of the sky. Uh, people who were doing a night watch, they were filming with ordinary cameras, but infrared cameras as well. Uh, when it went dark, um, it was only about three hours of darkness at that time of year in the UK. Um, uh, there was nothing there initially, and then when it started to get light, there it was. Um, this flash of light illuminated the whole of the sky and a lot of the BLT research shows that the whole of that field was affected with an energy signature, not just the crop formation. Um, so, you know, something powerful happened. Um, but what is also amazing is it actually appeared on the 7th of July 2007, which is 777, which again is a number that relates to the ascension. Then as if that wasn't enough, um, following on from that, last year the pièce de résistance um, was this awesome formation. Um, you saw this again, Jaime showed this yesterday. Uh, this is staggering. This is over 800 feet in length by over 600 feet in width. Um, it's so precise that as you look at this particular image um, here, um, it is literally as though it's like a laser cut wood block. And yet, it's just literally made by depressed flowing crop. And in fact, um, when it first appeared, the crop was standing at about a foot off the ground. Um, so it was a really lightly pressed, and yet it's such a precise image. Um, there was also a real sort of aspect of nature within it as well, which I think is, is really nice. If you look up on the, uh, the second circle down here, there's a little dot on the right there. Um, that actually was uh, a badger set, um, the, the animal, a badger. First time I've ever seen a badger set within uh, a working crop field. That in itself was strange, but the fact that it was right here um, and it was still you know, living in that, in that badger set after the event. When we went in here, there were deer running across the field, horses nearby. It had a really beautiful sort of natural element to it, as well as this really powerful image too. Um, and of course, at a basic level, um, the crucifix here not only relates to Christ, of course, um, but also it, it relates to the transformation of matter into spirit. Uh, this is the, um, uh, an aerial overview of that. So once again, you can see how huge these formations are. It's hard to grasp when you see them from an aerial overview, um, unless you actually go in with them, how big they are. Um, and you see this beautifully in the landscape. Um, just to give you an idea of the size of that, on the left there, there's a man standing in there. And in the center of that circle, and that one as well. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of people standing in there. So it gives you an idea of the vastness of these. And from ground level, you know, they just seem to stretch on like this one, I think, what is it, two or three football uh, pitches in length. Um, beautiful picture, Steve Alexander's picture there. OK, this is the final slide. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, 
it's becoming very, very clear that something really big is going on here. Um, and we need to prepare for that. Again, we have this environmental issue that's coming up, this crisis point that's happening, and that will affect everybody on Earth. That is no doubt about that. Um, and we are, we are starting to understand the agenda this particular week, as we have seen. You know, there's so much going on behind the scenes that most people haven't got a clue about. Um, something big is going on there as well. Uh, but we're starting to understand what's happening, and that is important because that sort of gives us a sense of being self-empowered. Um, we're having these amazing images coming into the fields which are showing us that there is a communication happening to give us this information, but that also we are cared for, and I think that's really important. Um, and we're understanding the UFO ET reality, this cosmic reality, so all these things coming together. Um, and I believe that this is leading towards this, this prophesied spiritual transformation, which is being acknowledged by the fulfillment of these prophecies as well. We are indeed in the most incredible times, and I think the next few years are going to be truly a staggering in, in the things that occur. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. I don't know if you have what the animal would be equivalent to in the, U in, uh, the US, but a badger is that sort of small, uh, largish um, black and white animal we have in the UK that uh, digs holes into the ground uh, and um, lives underground. Um, but because the fields are being worked by um, the farmers on a regular basis, um, I've never ever seen a badger set, a living, functioning badger set within a field before. Um, it's really unusual because the tractors are going up and, up and down. So why, why would an animal actually create its den uh, a fox, like a fox, um, you know, and they drag in their material into it. Um, um, so, that, to me, it was really unusual that you'd even see one in a field, let alone the fact that it was sort of interlinked in with this. So, to me, it just gave the impression, um, once again, that, that there is a connection with all of this, however mighty it is, but that we've got to look at Mother Earth as well. So, I thought that was quite astounding, very unusual. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Hiya. Hi, thank you very much. Um, crop circles are quite beautiful and they're a great way of sort of breaking the uh, ice with people yeah. uh, on this whole subject. Yeah. I have a few uh, crop circle books and they all have different crop circles. I think many of them are proprietary in nature because of the person who took the picture. Yeah. Has there been any attempt to coordinate all the crop circles on a worldwide basis in terms of their meaning and yeah. implications? And that, yes, um, they have. Um, Colin Andrews, you probably know of him, he was one of the leading um, researchers in the early days, in the 80s, um, initially, um, and um, others as well, um, quite a lot of the Dutch guys that come over are really into this. What they've done is they've put uh, often black and white aerial images into um, <coughs> websites, and they've looked at the, the evolution of the formations that have happened, which are tens of thousands. You know, I mean, there can be 50 or 100 in the UK every year. They're in over 42 different countries all around the world. Um, and um, there's definitely been an evolution. You know, the first one I showed you was the one in 1990, where it went beyond simple circles and circles with rings into this uh, a formation. And then, as you can see, the progression is just given, given as messages beyond geometry and mathematics. Um, but there are people who've actually plotted every single one of those uh, globally. And there is a, if you just scan through them like a, a flip page on, in a book, you know, it is staggering, absolutely staggering how the, they have evolved. And certainly for the UK, where some of these amazing formations appear, um, there is generally a theme every year um, where, you know, uh, whatever that may be, it'll be something new. There are hoaxes, no doubt about it. But there is the genuine formations, which usually sort of start to appear in a big way towards the end of the season, which is sort of uh, July, August, and 
last year, September, which is really unusual. Um, and um, you'll see a progression, but you'll see these sort of new themes, and each one starts to get people awakening. Sometimes mathematics are shown within these that mathematicians have never seen before. So it is amazing. But yes, to answer that question, there have been people who've sort of stored the tens of thousands of images that you can look at. Thanks. Hi, yeah, thank you very much yeah. for that. That was an amazing presentation, thank just you. the way you correlated the, the math and the science and the spirituality. It's really well, well done. Um, I just had heard story about the, um, the one crop circle with the alien in, in, the, in the picture, with the head, yeah. the one that you said wasn't maybe so friendly, yeah. and uh, that it was used for a, a, a advertisement or for, for a, you know, actually a ad campaign that it took a long time to make. So is, you're actually, can you verify again that that indeed was something that appeared, yeah. um, you said, in just a matter of hours? Because yeah. that's the stories going around that, that it was actually a planned hoax. It was part of a big ad campaign. I guess some yeah. company was using it as part of their, yeah. their ad campaign. And I was just yeah. curious. Um, that again, of course, there are formations out there that have been used for ad, ad campaigns. You know, breakfast cereals, uh, people, um, uh, sort of uh, chat shows who uh, in the UK, a couple of faces, people like that. Um, so that's a fact, that does go on. But the thing with the, um, that's known as the Crabwood Grey, uh, appeared at a place called Crabwood, is um, <coughs> there was a, a time delay between the face appearing and then the disc appearing. Um, but that in itself is profound because some people said they saw the face um, as a complete oblong and then suddenly you have this spiralling um, um, the spiral, which is like the disc, the message that was on the disc as well. Um, but the, many people living in the area um, said that they saw incredible anomalies at that time. Um, they believe it appeared really quickly. There were many balls of light that were seen around that site and UFOs as well. So um, I suspect from the people I've spoken to in my own research that the, the, the story is one of those that were put in after the event to diminish the power of that, that, that formation. Not only because it's so stunning, it shows a grey, which of course, you know, isn't wanted to be seen, and the message that's within the um, within the disc, as well. So, um, all I can say is, from my own research, I, I don't think I think that's a genuine formation. It's so profound, even to the darkening of the right cheek. I don't know how on earth you'd even do that, um, and not be seen uh, in just sort of three or four hours of darkness. Thanks. Hiya. You mentioned websites that have every single crop circle. Yeah. Uh, could you state the websites, please? Um, the two websites that I would highly recommend um, are um, temporarytemples.co.uk. Uh, that is run by Steve Alexander, who is one of the guys who takes some of the most profound images and been doing this for many, many years. Um, another one is called the cropcircleconnector.com. And that has, um, every day they have, um, when the formation is appearing, they have in the images there. So you can keep an eye on what's going on on a day-by-day -day basis, which is really important, of course, um, because then researchers can get together and go and see formations. If, they, if they're not aware of them themselves, because um, there are many people flying over the formations with uh, helicopters, airplanes, microlights throughout the whole season. Um, you know, um, someone is going to see a formation appearing. And, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, and this is a side issue, but it's really important, the sooner you get into a formation, the more likely it is you will see that it's genuine, uh, either because of the energy, because of the lay of the crop, if it's gentle or bent at a 90 degree angle from the knuckle, rather than clearly being crushed and broken and with footsteps and dirt in it, which is from the, uh, you know, the hoax formations. So that's important. Um, I'm not sure the actual uh, website of... Um, those images that have been taken for, for over years, but I know that Colin Andrews was certainly part of that process. Hiya. Uh, I've heard the translation frequently of the disc. Yeah. But I've never heard anyone say who did the translation or by what method. Yeah. Do you have information on that? Yeah. Um, I believe one guy was called Paul Vigay, bless him. Um, and I don't know the other guy's name, and they used um, what is known as the ASCII, ASCII code in the computer. Again, it's like um, uh, you know, the, the ones and the zeros. Um, I'm not too uh, up on the technical side of it, how they actually did it. 
but um, it's, it, was, it was using you know, all of those images that you saw as though it was ones and zeros, ones and zeros, ones and zeros, or zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero. And that was from the standing crop and the indented crop, standing crop, just like literally a spinning uh, CD disc. You know, mm -hmm. It's made up of just information, bits of information. So they did all that, put it all together, and it ended up coming out with that message, which was really profound. So. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.